is the story of the end of steam locomotive operation on the Grays Harbor Line. But before we haul logs on the railroad, let's look at logging. Big timber is felled and bucked in the Camp 3 area of the Wishka River watershed north of Hoquiam, Washington. Many species are logged. Hemlock is used in our pulp mills. Douglas fir is sold to the local plywood industry. And cedar is made into siding, shakes, and shingles. A modern track loader yards and loads logs along the right-of-way. After the truck is loaded, it leaves for the transfer, and another truck takes its place. The truck loads are transferred to rail cars for the 44-mile train trip to the Tidewater dump. Rayonier's off-highway trucks transfer their load at the forest end of the rail line. These trucks have wider bunks than are permitted on the state highways and can, therefore, haul much larger loads. The Crane Creek transfer was designed and built by timber division engineers. The truck moves in under a bridge crane parallel to the track. Bars are placed under the logs, and the entire load is lifted from the truck and placed on the rail car. Steel straps bound around each load prevent the heavier logs from sinking when they're stored in the water. This efficient operation has handled over 100 cars a day. The new Prairie River Bridge is a great improvement over the old piling bridge it replaces and is one of the many roadbed changes required in the conversion to diesel engines, whose weight is more concentrated than the steam locomotive. This 120-ton Baldwin Mallet was purchased new by the Bloedel Donovan Lumber Mills in 1927, and acquired by Rayonier in 1945 with the purchase of Bloedel's Clallam timber operation. is Camp 14, the oldest logging camp in the Grays Harbor area. The bunkhouses and other buildings are built on rail cars. Back in the old days, to move camp, they hooked everything onto an engine and moved up to new logging areas and lived close to the job. Camp 14 is only in partial use at the present time, but for historical interest, it's one of the show places of the area. Soon it will be abandoned. hard on a nine-tenths of one percent grade up Cook Creek Hill on a new bypass which eliminates two highway grade crossings and shortens the main line by two miles. The 38 is Rayonier's largest road engine, a 130-ton Sierra type Baldwin Mallet built in 1934 and purchased from the Sierra Railroad in California. The large butt logs on these cars are Sitka spruce sets an eight mile an hour speed limit across the Hump Tulips Bridge, but apparently the engineer has forgotten. On Axford Prairie, another major track relocation has been completed with 100 and 110 pound steel replacing the old 60 pound rail. beautiful and distinctive whistle was truly a trademark of an era. On a cold winter
winter morning, Loki 38 works pretty hard on this section of track. And there is a slight adverse grade. Extensive construction efforts were necessary in preparing this line for diesel operation. Many items of heavy equipment were used during the construction of the Cook Creek and Axford Prairie bypasses. But times have changed. When this railroad was first built, it was done with hand picks, wheelbarrows, Bagley scrapers, Fresnos, and teams. This is engine 14 again. And on this particular day, she's being used on a gravel train. The gravel is spread on the newly constructed grade to form a firm foundation for the ties. Two trains meet at the Hump Tulips River passing track. All engines are equipped with two-way radios and follow dispatcher's orders broadcast from railroad camp. Engine 70 is also on the gravel run. She is a saturated steam 70-ton Baldwin Mikado type built for the Folsom Logging Company in 1922. When number 70 was built, she was a big logging engine. But compared to the replacement diesels, she is a mere toy. Until completion of the new Prairie River Bridge, Loki 38 hauls logs over the old piling bridge. River normally looks like a small creek, but when warm rain melts the snow, runoff is high and it becomes a raging torrent, needing a substantial bridge to guard against the stream taking the grade away. Delivery of the first diesel locomotive marks the beginning of the new era on the Grays Harbor Line. Rayoneer's Railroad has no physical connection with the Northern Pacific Line serving Grays Harbor. So engines must be barged up the Hoquiam River and put onto the company line. It doesn't snow much or often in Grays Harbor, but when it does snow, it snows. The end of the line is on the river, yet it's still close enough to Grays Harbor to be affected by the tides. The barge is properly spotted on a grid and held in position while the tide recedes enough for the barge to settle onto the grid, so the rails on the barge can be connected to those ashore. Loki 38 is ready and waiting to pull a diesel engine from the barge when the connection is made. The rail connection will be made as soon as the barge drops another inch. Now everything is ready, and the Mallee pushes her idler cars down to hook up with the diesel and pull her off the barge. Off she comes onto the Rayonier line, as ordered. One 1,600 horsepower Baldwin engine, weight 165 tons. That man in the white coat, heaving a sigh of relief, is a representative from our insurance underwriters. Except for occasional sunny moments, 
38 hauls the new diesel into railroad camp through a continuing snowfall. And the master mechanic has had a cold first ride on the diesel. Loki 38 is uncoupled from this interloper that will soon take over its duties. Engine 14 moves up to push it into its berth at railroad camp for servicing. Silent Sentinels, the 90 and the 120, stand forlornly in the cold. March 31st, 1962, the day the steam engines, represented by the 90 and the 38, make their symbolic last run and the new diesels are dedicated. Visiting dignitaries, including the State Land Commissioner, State Forester, and other state and company officials, will ride in the cab of the 90 on her last run. Feather bedding, perhaps. The pre-dedication publicity mentioned that the State Land Commissioner would be the engineer on the 90 for her last run. And here, her regular engineer, who apparently took this statement literally, dismounts with a worried look on his face to find out if this is true. Had he not been assured that his hand would be at the throttle, he probably would not have climbed back on the engine. The executive vice president of Rayonier mounts the 90 for her last run. One blast on the whistle and away for her final run up the hill. is a Baldwin Mikado type 90 ton superheat engine which gives her a sharp staccato exhaust. To Rayonier officials, this is a memorable day. Over 3,000 people turned out to pay their respects to these fine old engines that are ending their years of service on the Grays Harbor Line. The small fry have quite a day for themselves too as they're permitted to spend a good deal of time on the engines. An occasion such as this would not be complete without some words of tribute being paid to these engines for their many years of service to the company. Words echoed in silent tribute from the rail buffs looking on. The words of praise are over. Old number 90 is unhooked from her train and run into a siding as the new diesel 90 moves in and takes over. The new number 90 heads for the Hoquiam River log dump with her first cargo, a large load of Douglas fir logs and a brand new caboose. Mallee 38 has been waiting about a mile down the grade for the 90 to leave the dedication site. She is not used to stomping on a hill and had a little trouble getting started up the grade. But being a tough old girl, she brings her 50 cars to a halt alongside the dedication stand. Camera fans not missing a turn of her wheels. A 
A small boy, already a real rail fan, complete with engineer's cap, watches the last day of steam. Old 38 is being relieved of her duties and diesel 45 takes over. The new 45 is numbered after a little 45-ton Baldwin 262 engine built for the Polson Company in 1906 and now on permanent display in Last Spur Park in Hoquiam. With the dedication ceremony over, railroad camp is open to visitors and the eight steam engines still in company service are on display. Each locomotive receives careful inspection from hundreds of fans wishing to preserve some memory of the event. And a local camera shop reports the highest film sales in any week in its history. Refreshments are served while fans wander freely wherever they choose, inspecting and photographing their favorite railroad equipment. One twenty, one eleven, one ten, the two spot, seventy, thirty eight, fourteen, ninety. Beautiful souvenirs of a bygone age. The fantastic, roaring, hissing, earth shaking, horse scaring monsters of steam railroading are now all shuffled into the boneyard of history, along with the horse cavalry and clipper ships. But they are not forgotten. From old timers who know steam lokies from their own experience, to future generations who must come to love them through the perspective of time, they remain priceless, revered symbols of a dynamic age, an age of growth and progress and challenge, an age that was railroaded.